Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bridget Kelly. I'm uh, the Deputy Coordinator from the Galway Traveller Movement. And I'd just like to welcome you all here this evening on behalf of the Travellers Together Preventing Suicide campaign. So how today's uh, webinar works, that the mics and videos of audience are turned off. And if anyone would like to leave any comments or have any questions, um, please do so. At the bottom of your screen, you will see that you have the opportunity for to leave any comments or questions. And if you don't mind, no personal stuff. And also just to say that if anyone's affected by today's discussion, we have suicide numbers for personal support are being sent out to all on Zoom, and they're shown on YouTube and Facebook. And the Samaritans 24 hour number is 116123. So we're going to um, get started and um, we're going to start off by launching today's webinar. And we've invited an amazing traveller woman, a community activist, and the first traveller female senator to be appointed to the Senate, to the Senate, who will launch the webinar and the importance of the topic on traveller suicide prevention. So I will now hand you over to Senator Eileen Flynn. Thank you. Um, thanks very uh, much, uh, Bridgie. Um, I'd like to thank the Traveller uh, Together Preventing uh, Suicide uh, Group for inviting me to uh, to, uh, to 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 launch uh, 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 this event. Um, for me, as a as a traveller woman, I do believe that us as travellers can prevent uh, a suicide within our own community. Um, I also believe that uh, society, the wider society, has a big role to play in preventing uh, traveller uh, suicide and preventing mental health within the traveller community. Some of the root causes to uh, to uh, traveller mental health is unemployment, is not having equal access to education, is uh, the levels of racism, discrimination, hatred that we face on, on a daily basis, feeling less in, in, in feeling less in the world, having those, feeling the rejection, even if you're not going to be rejected from a club or a pub or a, 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 a place, you always feel it that you're, that you're being rejected in one way, shape or form. So I think all those uh, issues have a big impact on us as a, as, 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 as a community of people. So I do think society as a whole have a, have a, have a part to play in preventing um, traveller um, as uh, suicide, um, I, look, I I find it is a very uh, touchy, very sensitive uh, subject to speak about. Is uh, suicide? We all know somebody who's uh, died by suicide. We all know families who've been uh, impact, inf uh, impacted by suicide. Um, traveller men are seven times more uh, higher to die by suicide than men in the general population. Traveller women six times more higher to die by suicide than uh, women in the general population. 11% uh, of deaths within the traveller community uh, are uh, caused by suicide. That's a crisis. That's a crisis within our community. Um, uh, from the behaviour and attitude um, survey that was done uh, in 2017, eight out of ten travellers uh, said they'd been affected by, by uh, suicide, and nine out of ten travellers in Dublin area said they'd been impacted by suicide. If this was in the general population, it would be seen as a crisis. In our community, it's a crisis. We're going to um, move on now, and we're going to um, have our panel discussion. Um, so we're just, um, I'm going to now hand you over to uh, Thomas McCann, who is the director of the National Traveller Counselling Service. So, um, yeah, over to you, Thomas. Uh, the panel is all very welcome. Um, I'm going to uh, briefly ask, I have um, um, uh, a couple of people with me, uh, Para Riley, I'll just name them and then they can, they're going to give a brief introduction themselves and I'm going to ask them to say a little bit about their work. Uh, Para Riley uh, uh, from Pavy Point, uh, David McCarty, um, uh, uh, Excess Officer with LIT, Margaret McDonough, Community Development Worker from Balbriggan, and Frank Kavanagh, um, uh, a mediator with the Traveller Mediation Services. And uh, you are all very welcome. Um, I think I've got everybody in there. Um, hopefully I did anyway. 
Um, uh, now, I'll start with you, Pa. Pa, would you um, uh, briefly introduce yourself and kind of, um, I, I, know, I know you might be showing a video or something, but briefly introduce the work that you do and how that contributes to kind of uh, supporting uh, uh, um, uh, Traver suicide. You, pa, I can't hear you. We come back to you, Pa. Go to someone else. And yeah. That, that. Okay. Okay. We'll come back to you. Maybe I'll go to David. David, uh, you're very welcome, David. That's fine. Uh, and can you hear me? Yeah. Very much, Thomas. Yeah, I can hear you there. Right. Well, you're very welcome. I hope we don't have too many glitches. And uh, um, uh, you're the, an excess officer with um, LIT, uh, soccer player. Yeah, and soccer player. Is that there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Ex uh, ex yeah. Excess officer, no, Thomas. Uh, yeah. Maybe you'd recently, you'd actually, I about yourself and your and your, and the work that you do. Yeah, yeah. My name is David McCarthy. There, I'm a ex LIT access officer. I was working with the travellers and early school leavers in LIT for probably about eighteen months there, up until February just gone. But I decided to take the plunge and go back to college to study uh, PE teaching now. So I'm going to be starting in UL University of Limerick in. Just over two weeks now, so I'm looking forward to that new challenge, really. But um, prior to that, I was working for about 10 years in, in various different organisations, working with young travellers, traveller men and different traveller families, used particularly around education and sport. So having spoke to uh, Maria and John O'Brien there in the past, they've asked me to come on and give it give a bit of a bio about myself and then talk about some of the work I've done and some of the work I'm doing currently as well. So, particularly around sports, really, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Pat, or uh, Dave, thanks very much. And um, 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 maybe, uh, would you, how would this, the work that you that you were involved in just contribute to support and the prevention of suicide? How would you see that? Well, we looked at, I looked at to provide a, a service wherever I've worked in the past, Thomas, around giving people a safe place to go to so they can come and yeah. feel free to talk about whatever they may want to you know, talk about, whether it be just your everyday day-to-day -day chat or if they've got any other personal stuff that they would like to chat about, we would put them in the right direction, you know, to the, to the relevant ser you know, service providers. So just providing a safe place, really, somewhere that people can come and feel comfortable to talk, to feel like they can be themselves. And um, usually that's, that's the kind of setting I try to provide in, in yeah, workplace really. Yeah, and it's so important. Like, I mean, I know it sounds simple, doesn't it? A safe place for people to talk, but it's so important. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it comes down to a lot. I was having a, a kind of a personal, open, personal approach to people, really, to treat them as human beings. Really, and, you know, it, none of us really know what other people are kind of dealing with in their, in their everyday lives. So, just being a, a friendly face or a friendly place where you can stop off and have a cup of tea or whatever it may be, you know, it can be, it can make all the difference, really. It can make a huge difference. And it takes a bit of confidence to, uh, to create that space as well, you know, to create that safe space for somebody to be in and allowing them to talk, you know. Absolutely. And if you're, if you're creating a space, Thomas, where people don't feel like they're being judged or they don't feel like yeah. they're being pushed or, you know, no one's there, you know, rushing them on, on what they're saying or what, what that may be, then people tend to come back and people tend to engage in, Different, um, you know, different activities or different yeah. services that we, we provide. Yeah, and they'll come back again once they once they know that space is there. Once they know that space is absolutely, available. absolutely, yes, yeah, for sure. Okay, well, thanks very much, David. We'll come back into the into the big group again. Pa, can we hear you at this stage? Or, ah, uh? I, I hope so, Thomas. Can people uh, hear me? Uh, I can hear you now. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're, we're on the go. Brilliant. Yeah, Thomas, listen, th yeah, thanks very much. And I just want to say thanks to the other speakers, in particular Elizabeth, sharing her story. Um, very brave. And I'm sure travellers up and down the country would uh, resonate with what Elizabeth said. Yeah, I'm Paul Riley, a mental health worker in Parvey Point. I work with the mental health team there myself, along with another traveller, um, Geraldine McDonald. And in our work, uh, we work on people... We'll come later on, we'll see how complex mental health is. But our work is, is the prevention to try and keep travellers well. And um, there's examples of that. And um, I have a video that I had done in preparing for this. And if it's okay, we could show it to the viewers. And then we can have a discussion in the panel later on.
Okay, we'll put on the video and, and have a look at it, yeah? And the, the video, it's kind of explained, it, it's more self-explanatory around um, the ethnic identifier and people might be aware of it, people might not be aware of it. Right. And then we have the text parvy to 50808, people might be aware of it, they might not. But uh, I think in the interest of time, in the panel discussion, I can speak to both of them under the questions and I can elaborate. I want to say a bit about the ethnic identifier because that's the main bit in the video, is it? Well, that's part of the video and that's the important bit, Thomas. It's, um, it's really to encourage uh, services to, to, to engage with the ethnic identifier and implement it into their service. And there's benefits to that. And it's um, beneficial boldly that travellers self-identify when they enter the service. So the service can, be, can make plans to be culturally appropriate for travellers. Because we've seen in the past, Thomas, that one shoe size fit all, it doesn't work for everyone. Yeah. And then we, there's training around that, you know, for, for staff that has fears and worries, because we get asked all the time, um, is it legal to ask the question? And we say, yes, it is, once it's done in a human rights framework. But I think um, if we can get the video shown at some stage, well and good, but um, I can touch on it later on in, in the panel discussion as well. Yeah, and we can put it. We can put it up on on the on the YouTube with the thing. Yeah, just, that, how does the how does the how does the ethnic identifier, if implemented, how would it how does it contribute uh, uh, preventing this, uh, 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 suicide among travellers? Yeah, good question, Thomas. So basically, like um, you're providing a service, and yeah. it's it's very important to know who's accessing your service, and yeah. it's equally important to know who's not accessing your service yeah so we show you gaps yeah. so we we all know here tonight um the traveler mental health and suicide rates among the traveling community is of serious high mm. it was already spoken before eileen had spoken about the it's a crisis stage yeah. we have ministers come and go making these promises all the time that mm. yes it's a crisis stage we already know this stuff the value of the ethnic identifier thomas is yeah. that the services are aware of who's, who's accessing their service and they can plan for, for who's accessing their services. So going back to the one shoe size fit all, it can, they can tailor their service to their, the groups that's entering their, their service. Yeah. So like, travellers at the minute is invisible in the services. It's yeah. basically, Thomas, what you said there, invisible, and it's about making the invisible visible. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's, um, and Thomas, we want this not, not just in a mental health service, we want this across all the, the mainstream health yeah. um, administrators because um, the, the example I can give for you, like, um, I'm here tonight and I'm expecting three or four, say, four people to come to me this evening. I can plan for four people, I can have dinner ready for four people. If yeah. three comes along with them, I'm not prepared because I, yeah. I, I wasn't expecting them to come along. So there's advantages to the ethnic identifier for services, but it also, Thomas, we need travellers to enter the service and to self-identify. That's very important also, to yeah. let the services know. Yeah. And if we can get the video, I, I have um, examples of why it's important to, um, to self-identify and for the ethnic identifier to be implemented into the services. Okay. Well, look, thanks for that, Pat. And identifier and ethnic data. Yeah, and we get asked a lot of this in our work, so we thought we'd just do a brief introduction to it um, today. So before we look and kick on, we're looking at what is ethnicity and what is nationality. Now, given the time that I have today, I, I will just briefly touch on it. You could talk for hours upon hours and upon hours regarding what is ethnicity when you go into it. But for, for me, our ethnicity and being a traveller is our language, our cant, our customs around funerals, music, traditions, and uh, tinsmitten. Um, so there's a lot to it in, in that sense. But another day, there, there is training there available to be talking about what is ethnicity. The nationality for me is I'm Irish and my ethnicity is traveller. So I'm an Irish traveller. Similar, if you go, say, in England, you would have, say, travellers in England, their nationality would be English, and their ethnicity would be traveller. So the key terms um, is what is ethnic data, 
and it's data based on a person's ethnicity. Let them be traveler or let them be Roma. What is an ethnic identifier? A universal question on ethnicity. Well, what is a universal question? So if you look here on the census, on the left-hand side, you can see the question, what is your ethnic group or background? And what that essentially means is everyone gets asked that question. And we will touch a bit more on that later on in the presentation. So what is ethnic equality monitoring? It's a process used to collect, store, analyze, and use data about ethnicity in a systematic way. So it's really important that not only do you, you, you collect the data, you store it, you analyze it, and you use the data. You know, um, ideally, you, you don't want to be doing one without the other, you know, so, and it's really important that you not only co collect it and leave it there, that, that is n n not really any good. You really have to, to use the data to do all that, that's there to regard the ethnic equality monitoring. So why collect data? Um, firstly, for the why collect data and why share your ethnicity. And I'm going to explain here that one of the reasons is the section 42 of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Act, which places a duty on public services funded by government to eliminate discrimination and promote equality. And to do this, um, accurate information is needed. But not only that, um, like, it's very important that you know who's accessing your services. Let it be travellers, let it be Roma, regardless of what the group is. But it's also equally important that who is not accessing our services. Because we hear this from mental health services all the time. Travellers are not engaging in the services. And yet there's a, a mental health crisis among travellers. So it's equally important that, that this is very valuable to collect this data. And why share your ethnicity? Once again, very, very important that you share your ethnicity. Um, the maternity hospitals, for example, we know that classic glastosemia is very high among traveller children born into traveller parents. And if not detected in infancy, it can have a fatal effects. So it's very important that the staff and the doctors are aware that you, you identify as a traveller to, to address that. And it's very important that travellers really engage with identifying their ethnicity. So who collects data in Ireland? The HSC, the biggest employer in Ireland, the census, primary and secondary schools and others. But we have always been calling here in PowerPoint, we have always been calling that health services and mental health services need to be collecting the data. We get asked this all the time, is it legal? If I ask the question, can I get in trouble? No, it, you cannot, it is illegal. It is legal to collect the information. Informed consent, very important, because if I don't give consent, nothing can happen. So informed consent is really important. And what that essentially means is that no matter what I sign, no matter what I say yes to, I always want that information. What am I saying yes to? What happens to my information? Where does it go? Voluntary self-identification, very, very important. You as a service provider, you just asking the question, you cannot assume that this person is a traveler and you fill in the box for them. That is not the way you do it. You ask the question and the training would provide this information. You would ask the question of the person, that's your job done. It is up to the person to self-identify. The universal question, we spoke earlier about it. You access a service. For me, I'm, someone says, Pa, we ask this question of everyone. That's fine. I'm more likely to engage. The information is accurate and only used for the purpose which it is collected, which is very important that it's only used for that purpose. The information is kept confidential and anonymous, so individuals are not identified. So regardless of who sees my information, they can't identify and say, oh, look, that's Pat Riley. And collecting ethnic data also recommended by international human rights bodies, CERD and FCNN. So before we move on to uh, good practices, um, we've always said it, look, Travel and mental health just simply cannot wait. It's a crisis stage. 
We see that one in 10 travelers die by suicide and it's totally unacceptable. So a good example that people might be aware of is text PAVI to 50808. And it is a national mental health text service available to young people nationally 24 seven. And it's free and it's completely anonymous. And you text talk with a trained volunteer. PAVI Point partnered with the HSE and 50808 to support traveler inclusion within their mental health tech service. We also provided anti-racism and discrimination training to volunteers and staff through developing an online module. Text PAVI 50808 to capture traveler engagement to the 50808 is very, very important. No matter where you are in the country, no issue is small or big, and by texting the word PAVI, the volunteer knows that there's a traveller to the other side of the phone. And that volunteer would have underwent training that we spoke about. So, as I said, it's really just a brief introduction today. And I'm available for questions. And I would encourage anyone that would like more information or, or any training regarding the ethnic identifier and ethnic data, please contact Pavi Point. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Pa. That was uh, very interesting. Um, we, we'll, as I say, we'll come back to uh, the panel uh, the, uh, in, in a few minutes to the whole panel again in a few minutes. But uh, um, Margaret, we'll um, Margaret McDonald from Balbriggan. Uh, maybe you'd kind of give us a brief introduction about yourself, and you're going to talk about a particular program that Balbriggan were, were involved in, which I, I'm very much aware of and was involved in myself. So. Uh, so Margaret, maybe you'd say something about that work. Firstly, um, can everyone hear me properly? Yeah. yeah. Off issues with the, the mic on this uh, laptop. Uh, so my name is Margaret O'Donnell. I'm a development worker with Balbriggan Travel Project in Dublin. Um, I suppose our work is outreach based. So we do have a community centre. We're very isolated where we are. We're based on a horse's site in North County Dublin, right on the top of the county. Um, so I suppose for the supports for families, we do kind of based on our outreach. Uh, we get phone calls as with the primary health care program. Myself, I deal with other issues, kind of more serious issues in the country, mental health um, and accommodation issues, etc. Um, I suppose for us, um, the benefit. Sorry. You're okay. I thought somebody was speaking there. Um, so the benefit of the service, I suppose, is that we think. We link people in with different services by signposting, by advocating on their behalf, and by meeting up with the services and giving a face to the name. So it breaks down that kind of barrier um, and stuff like that. But I'm going to go into, I'm just going to turn this off because I don't know how to screen share. Um, I tried it and it didn't work before. Um, so I'm just going to talk about Mind the Gap program. So Mind the Gap uh, was something Thomas is well aware of, uh, Thomas would have you involved in it. Uh, so it was started way back in 2013 and it turned out to be an absolutely fantastic uh, project um, and we're hoping to set it up again soon. So I'm just going to go into a bit of detail as well. And I'm also, uh, for Kerry Cuskily, uh, who I'll speak about in a minute, was the mental health social worker in the area at the time and she wrote for a journalist. So I'm going to read you um, an excerpt out of that as well. Margaret? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. I don't, can't see you anymore, but... Yeah, no, you, you're just going to have to listen All to right, some... Okay, right, okay. You go ahead. Sure. So basically, in 2013, the mental health social worker, Carrie Cusley, uh, she's based in Balbriggan, she approached the then organisation, Fingal Travellers Organisation, which I was the family support worker there at the time, um, to link in in regards to travellers suffering with mental health issues in the area. Um, Thomas also became involved, um, and from this, we sorry, Travel Council Service became involved, which was Tom there at the time. And um, from this, we created a partnership with Kerry, Single Travellers Organisation, the Primary Healthcare Team, myself, Family Support Worker, and Travel Council Service. Um, we had a number of meetings, and we decided um, to call the group the Single Mental Health Action Group. And after several meetings, we felt um, it would be very beneficial to do a peer led travel mental health survey to see what were the exact issues that were facing the community in our area. 
Uh, so I suppose the survey highlighted issues um, that I would say are across the board, but this was in our area. So some of them were inadequate living conditions, um, so overcrowding, uh, cramped conditions, uh, you know, living in halting sites, not being able to get um, houses when they want them, uh, difficulty accessing employment, lack of income to provide for the family, uh, and mental health, health issues within the family. Um, so, and to our knowledge, this was actually the first time that this kind of survey was carried out by a travel organisation. And since then, other travel organisations have completed it uh, with members of the community in their areas. Uh, and one organisation is still in the process uh, now of collating their findings to create a report from that. So that was a great benefit as well. Um, so, sorry. So uh, after this, we decided um, we'd hold a local conference uh, to explore the issues that were highlighted in the survey. Um, but we invite mental health services and other services along, um, along with travellers to look at how we could work in partnership to address the issues um, that travellers were facing in the area in regards to mental health. Uh, one of the recommendations that came from the conference was to create a space where travellers and local service providers could come together um, on an ongoing basis, try and find ways of breaking down the barriers and bridging the gaps um, to travellers accessing services. Um, and this was the beginning of the Mind the, Mind the Gap Lunch Time Discussion Programme. Um, so Kerry wrote um, in a journal, and I'm just going to read it because I think um, she, she says exactly what I'm going to say, but she, she says it very well. I'm just going to read this now, please. So the application of the partnership process model resulted in development and implementation of the Mind the Gap Lunch Time Discussion Group. Um, so the aim of the Lunch Time Discussion Group is to bring together local services providers and members of the community in order to mind the gap, which exists between them and the travel community um, and explore mental health and ways that the service providers and the travel community could work together to bridge that gap. Um, a lot of the groundwork went into ensuring the successful outcome of the discussion group series. Um, the key person in this was Susie McCarthy. So Susie was the primary health care coordinator at the time um, and Susie did a lot of on the ground work um, which was making sure that they, uh, along with myself and the primary health care team, we went out make sure the travellers knew that they Groups were happening, when they were happening, what time, and trying to facilitate them coming along, which was very good. A lot of people came to them and continued to come over the, the whole series of groups uh, on a session. Um, and then the practicalities with refreshments, uh, laptops, projectors, stuff like that. And to be honest, um, even having a sandwich, of, you know, a couple of biscuits and a cup of tea ready for everyone was very relaxed. Um, and it just added something to it. You know, it wasn't a, a formal meeting, people just came in and were very relaxed. Um, so several teams were identified by the Fingal Travel Mental Health Action Group as a potential discussion for the top topics for the group. Um, and some of them were the impact of internalised depression on travel mental health, the, inter the, sorry, the impact um, on inter-family conflict on travellers and the sense of well-being, uh, addiction and drug use in travel community, the cultural competency and the need for culturally inclusive services. So that's a huge one as well. The service is not being culturally aware and culturally competent. Um, so people is to access the service the first time and they didn't find that it was uh, welcoming to them and their needs, they didn't return. Um, and the social environmental conditions that travellers are living in and the impact it has on their mental health, uh, anxiety, stress, depression, etc. and relationships. Um, so I'm just going to skip to the end because I'm just conscious that we've an hour that being left. Um, so I suppose for us, the direct benefit to the community, so there was a lot of benefits to this, it went really, really well. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping to start it up again soon. I'm just recently back into a role in that organisation, where the new one now, Valpurg and Travellers Project. Um, and I suppose that's something that went really, really well, and I think it was a benefit to, to bring it back. But the direct benefit to the community was the strong links that were created with services and are still there to this day, um, uh, which took some of the fear and anxiety away from people, because they met face to face in a relaxed environment with mental health services and with a mental health social worker. And I think a huge thing that Kerry did, Thomas, and I, I don't know if you remember this um, happening, but Kerry used to do a drop-in service in the evening. And a lot of the men who wouldn't have sought the, the support um, of their GP or anyone else uh, began coming in and speaking with her privately in the evening. Um, so that was a huge, huge support um, for travellers in the area. Um, but I suppose that's a, a little bit about what it was about. Um, and I, again, it was just it was a fantastic resource. And, genuinely it's something we need to focus on bringing back to the area. Okay well listen thanks very much Margaret for that indeed I remember it well and enjoyed the sessions and kind of looking forward to kind of 
you know, getting them up and running again because they were really good. I mean, they were honestly, they were, they were like, I mean, to have the community and mental health services coming back and kind of engaging in the discussion, that, you know, a kind of the, the taboo starts to break down and people start to kind of engage at a different level. And, and it was really, really good. So I'm looking forward to it. Just a quick question, Margaret, from your perspective, how do, how do you see that? Uh, uh, kind of contributing, or has it contributed to kind of supporting uh, the prevention of suicide among travellers? It has come because even like that, that started initially in 2013. Yeah. So seven years later, um, I jumped ship and I'm, I'm back recently, as I said. So yeah. I was out of the role, out of the area. I wasn't involved in any of the work that was going on. And I've come back and back now 18 months. And those relationships and those links are still there. Yeah, yeah. But now people have changed. But you might know, know people have gone to different roles or whatever. But they've heard about Mind the Gap, or they've heard about the organisation, the work that was previously done. So I think for that, and also with the community on the ground, and for me, and no more than the rest of you, it's the, it's the people on the ground that we're always conscious of, and it's bringing their voices to the table. So yeah. we can think one thing, but if we don't go out and find out, you know, what what are they saying? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And I suppose that's, that's good as well because they still see us as if they're anxious, if they're nervous, they'll come for, you know, well, can you check it out for me? It's the trust building. And yeah. once you can be that link between the two, and then, you know, when that's set up, kind of take a step back, I think that has worked really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's great to hear that people are still talking about it and kind of them relationships are still there. So it shows that it does have an impact. I'll give one, one more thing, I'm sorry. Um, I want to say as well, before this um, initially started, and, and even up to now, we've had great support from yourself. Kyron is out there uh, once or twice a week, and travellers are accessing that service as well. So just to say, even apart from Mind the Gap, the Travel Council service has been very, very supportive to the family in the area. Yeah. And again, it's great to see so many travellers self-preparing, you know, out in, in Tingo, you know, the majority of travellers now have come to the service out there. The counseling side of it, uh, our self repairing so so it really has kind of uh, thanks Margaret and um, and now Frank Frank sorry for you're just sitting there <laughs> uh, you're all right Thomas uh, you're very welcome and uh, indeed I know some of the work that you're involved in as well uh, Frank so maybe maybe you just uh, briefly kind of introduce yourself and some of the work you're involved in I will indeed Thomas yeah first of all I want to say well done to uh, your panelists and the work that they're doing and also well done to Elizabeth. It's never easy telling your own personal story, especially mm -hmm. on an open stage as well. Well done. I hope your son makes a full recovery. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Frank Cavanagh. I'm a mediator with the Travel Mediation Service. Um, I took off employment in 2019, January last year. Um, I suppose before that, Thomas, I was a men's health, travel men's health worker with Alfie Travel Movement. And uh, that we can then work with the Travel Remediation Service. A lot of our work, Tom, is, is on the road the whole time. Yeah. It's meeting people in sites, in their homes, wherever they feel comfortable meeting them. I suppose the, the, area, the area of our work is, is travel conflict, disputes. A lot of people call it feuding. Um, and I suppose, Thomas, it's traveler on traveler is a lot of the work, but also a lot of our work is traveler and agencies in dispute sometimes, or it could be traveler and non travelers. As long as there's travelers involved, we can get involved. Um, a lot of our work as well now that people might know about as well, Thomas, a lot of training. Yeah. We run a lot of courses. Uh, to this date, we're after running three courses in partnership with the Edward Kennedy Institute in Minute, where we train traveler men and women to become qualified mediators. Um, last year, we, went, we ran the first course of its kind in a prison, Castlery prison, where we trained prisoners and two teachers to become a qualified mediator. So, so out of that eight, there was two teachers and there was four travel men that, that are now qualified mediators within the prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're hoping in January, depending on COVID-19, we're running a, a youth project from 16 to 19 year olds in partnership with Athlone AIT and Leash Offley ETB and ourselves. So. Yeah. 
And, and, and again, Frank, you know, conflict, the whole area of conflict. I remember we, we had the conference in Dublin right, Castle yeah. to look at the impact. So, like, that kind of highlighted the impact of uh, interfamily conflict on mental health. I mean, on, on, right, like on, the, on the wider community, but also on families and children and yeah, on family life, you know, kind of um, the, whole, the stress that comes from that kind of sleepless nights, the, you know, kind of, and the trauma as well is there sometimes long after the physical kind of effects has been. Dealt with. It is, it is, Thomas, especially when you have interfamily conflict. It, it, it's different than, than, than having conflict with someone that you're not in contact with every day or, or someone you're not going to meet at different, different occasions, different events. So you have to start avoiding them and you start to become isolated and you see people isolate themselves because they don't want to get involved in this conflict. Um, also, as you said, like, like you hit on there, having sleepless nights, the lack of eating, the anxiety of going around the place. Yeah. You know, like, it has a, a, an awful effect on, your, on, on people's mental health, yeah. mental health, you know. Yeah. And Frank, your own work and that of the mediation service, mm. you know, kind of, how, you know, how does that uh, contribute to, I suppose, positive mental health and, and in particular uh, kind of, you know, supporting uh, the prevention of suicide? How would you see that from your own perspectives? Well, Thomas, I suppose, as I said earlier on there, a lot of our work is beating travellers where they are. And sometimes when travellers are drenched in conflict, they don't hear what's being said or they don't see what's being done. And sometimes if we set for Chris or Kerry or Aileen, arrive on site and we meet with families, we talk to the families, sometimes it's nice for someone just to listen to them, to hear their side of the story. Yeah. And we give them that space to do that. And, and, and because we're a confidential service, so everything they said with us is confidential. Uh, confidential, confidential sorry. Yeah. So people, people, so you start to build up trust with these people. People start to trust you. And then sometimes, Thomas, like when you work with people, and uh, and there could be mental health problems there, you start to signpost to different organisations. Yeah. Could be a national organisations, local organisations, organisations or services like yourself, travel council service. Yeah. So sometimes it gives people a peace of mind. Well, I'd like to think it gives people a peace of mind sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's really important. And one of the things that seems to be coming up from across all the, the speakers so far is the need, that kind of, you know, um, the importance of creating a space, you know, whether a safe space uh, that's confidential, that's non-judgmental, you know, um, creating them spaces. Likewise, you know, creating a space with the service providers, you know. So creating spaces, STEM spaces, seems to be a very important part of nearly all the work so far that people, including ourselves in the Travel Council Service, creating that space that somebody feels okay, talk about whatever's on their mind, you know, um, and uh, create that, um, that safety and confidentiality and, and that non-judgmental space. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open it up a bit now and, um, and kind of uh, uh, put out a couple, of, a couple of general questions. And indeed, anyone that's, um, all the people who's tuned in are all very welcome. And, you know, if you have a question, we won't get to all the questions, but some of the questions we might be able to cover particularly some of the representative ones, you know, but we're here to lay the clock and so we have a bit of time. And uh, so one of the first things that I suppose um, that I'd be asking and that we've looked at is, uh, what does the panel uh, believe are some of the root causes? Now Eileen talked about, kind of touched on some of them. What, maybe I'd open it up. So I'll just open it up to the panel as to what some of the root causes of, of suicide among travellers are, or some of the contributing, major contributing factors. So. I mean, I'll just, I'll just put that out to the panel. So maybe who would ever like to... Never, kind of. Thomas, will I kick on? Will I take this question, if I oh, may? Yeah. Um, I think it's quite obvious, and you said it there, we don't want to be repeating what other people are saying. And it's quite obvious that there's no just one thing. You know, there's no one issue or one root cause. It's layers upon layers. It's just like the iceberg. You can see at the top, but you don't, can't see what's underneath. Like racism discrimination, for example, we hear of the racism discrimination and it's not just your, look, you can't be served here tonight or the K mm -hmm. word in, in the schoolyard. Yeah. It, it's more than that. It's, it's our young travellers that, that has to hide their identity on application forms, can't get work, can't get work experience. Then they're, they're left being staying around sites. The boredom is kicking in, self-esteem is going down. Bereavement. 
I think everyone that's, that's here tonight, we know that bereavement is very, very common among travellers. And um, the impact of that uh, is also having an effect on travellers' mental health. I also think, Thomas, and um, we, we've seen it over the years and, and it's still very, very much prevalent, the knowledge of someone dying by suicide. We see the impact. That is really a serious <sighs> impact on travellers. When a traveller dies by suicide, the family, the immediate family, is at high risk. They're vulnerable, they're grieving, their thoughts are not clear. What seems a good idea now is not down the line. So to me, the root causes is not just one thing. You look at the low education, you look at the high unemployment. It's broad. It's very, very broad when it comes to travel and mental health. And just to touch on the point there, I see a question in the chat regarding the LGBT. Our community is very, very diverse now. Do you know, we have LGBT travellers, we have travellers that's disabled, and we're a diverse community. And um, times are moving along, but travellers, are, are, there's a sense of getting met where they're at, but we're being left where we're at. And that's not on, and that's what's impacting on travellers. Okay. Thanks. Okay, other members of the panel, um, Margaret, yeah. Just uh, leading on to what you were saying there about um, this is a very, very brief story, but it just really hit me. So, just I, I'm aware that there's a lot of people watching this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail because obviously I'm not going to name the person. But last year, um, I I got to know this, this, this absolutely fantastic young young person, and they got I knew them for a couple of weeks, and they came up to me and they were you know kind of nervous and stuff like that, and, and said, I need to tell you something. And I said, one ahead, and they said, um, I'm gay. So, I, you know, as any friend would, like, yeah. I'm like, you're you, all of that. So, fast forward, uh, maybe another week or two later, and the same person um, came up to me. And this time, it just really hit me how how anxious they looked. They looked, they were next to tears. Yeah. Very different than they did when they, were, when they were coming out to me. And they said, I want to tell you something. And I was like, all right. And he said, and he whispered, I'm a traveller. And that really, really hit me. That this country is not accepting, it, it, it is, has moved on in ways, but it's not accepting of the LGBT community, and we're well aware of that. But when a young person of 20 odd years of age feels, you know, freer, and thank God he does feel freer to come out with that, um, but doesn't feel the same about admitting he's a traveller and who, that's his identity, so he was born. That really hit me. So I think identity is a huge one. It, yeah. we, as a community, we're, as Pat said, we're quite diverse. We're, we're, you know, have moved on in so many aspects of the of the culture. But I think young people are stuck in an in between. You know, there's what are travellers today? You know, they're they're stuck with 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 what they want to do with new things, all of this. And then when you get that label of traveller, and you're, you know, you can't go out with your friends because you're the one that's not going to get served. You, you have to choose where you go, what you do, all of this stuff. I think as a young person, it's so much pressure on them. But that's where the denial of the culture and the denial of the identity comes in. So identity, is there, you're, you know, kind of is a key issue, the denial of traveller identity and kind of not being able to express one's identity. Uh, other, uh, other members of the panel? Yeah, Thomas, can I jump in there? <laughs> Stay with yeah. They yeah, just, to come in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, please, Thomas. Yeah, go yeah, in. Yeah, come on in. I suppose what what I'd like to talk about today is the the rise of the online social media hate. Yeah. And, um, the impact that is having on on our young people's mental health, but also travelers in general from any age, any age of people that are going online, be it your Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, the newer ones, you know that I'm not overly familiar with, but like Twitter is a cesspit for hate towards travellers at the moment. You can't go on without ten, every 10 seconds I scroll down the page there's someone commenting some negative stuff about traveller hate and, and, and prejudice and racism towards travellers. So what I'd like to be seeing and, and I'd like to be pushing the government on is to, you know, implement um, fines and, and, you know, Catching these people who are coming up with these uh, online hate comments and so so yeah. on, and uh, I do think that it's having a big impact on travellers' mental health, really. Yeah. Um, as well as that, some of uh, and Margaret have touched on some of the other ones, but 
again, high unemployment rates, lack of education, these all weigh heavily on, on people's you know, mental health. And unless we increase participation in college and, and participation in the uh, workforce, we're going to continue to see these these uh, challenges and these struggles for, for travellers going forward. Yeah. But I think you're right, David. I think that social media certainly has, you know, um, um, kind of has had a very, uh, in many ways, a very negative influence, you know, in terms of travel, you know, both in terms of the, I mean, you might be aware of this as well, Frank and others, yeah. in terms of the conflict side of it, but also the online bullying, you know, kind of, and, and that whole side of it. And, and indeed that has, for, set, for many settled people as well, that's, the, that's been the case, but, but certainly in travellers. Um, uh, and what about yourself, Frank? Yeah, Thomas, uh, you touched on it there about Facebook and, and, and social media. Social media seems to have a lot of influence on our young travellers these days. Yeah. And, uh, and also something I want to touch on as well, Thomas, and I see a lot of it, is peer pressure. Yeah. Is that young boys and girls, travellers, have to act a certain way, have to be a certain way. You know what I mean? They have to be seen doing something similar to everyone else. And to see to be doing something different, our own community turn on them. Well, not turn on them, but they'll judge them. They'll talk about them. They're different. You know what I mean? And, and again, David touched on it again there, Pat and Margaret as well, is, is like the high level of unemployment as the low level of education. And like myself and my colleague, Chris McDonough, we'd often be inside. So we see young traveller men, men and women there. We'd often be talking to them and ask them, why did they leave school? And we get the same response every time we go, is what's the point of staying in school when there's no jobs after? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like, look, as Tara Riley said earlier on, sorry? That, that internal judgment by the community of your yeah. day. When we talk about diversity, and we mentioned LGBT, mm. you know, and difference and kind of, uh, and as a community, there's a lot of diversity within every community, but within the travel community as well. But yet there's internal judgment if, if people are different. And other, other travelers have talked about this in the past, and sometimes people feel very isolated and kind of very alone in that, you know. And are not accepted by not feel they're accepted by the settled community, but maybe feel caught in that bind between not being not being fully accepted within the community either, or kind of you know being judged within the community. So so that's a hard one as well uh, for people, you know. It can be, yeah. Uh, so it is. Um, but uh, going on then, moving on a little bit from that, and I better go into the questions and see if there are any questions coming up that we can try and. Uh, is how does the projects? or some, some of the projects that she's are involved in, uh, contribute to combating the, the, the root causes. We're saying well, we've named racism, unemployment, social media, uh, kind of um, identity, you know, um, uh, there's a few others there as well, uh, you know, kind of, uh, but uh, how, does, how does the projects that you, you, the panel is involved in, Contribute to or to uh, uh, counteract, uh, you know, uh, to, 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 to the contributing factors or to the root causes that, that lead to suicide. Again, will I take that question, Thomas? If that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think Thomas, um, the the prevention work we've been doing it for so many years now. We've been highlighting that you need like better and safe accommodation. That will improve your mental health. We yeah. look at the, the issues. We look at employment, education. And we, we're trying to, do, we're doing the suicide prevention work in one aspect in a way by trying to improve the overcrowding, try and get travellers to, to stay on in education, to, to get uh, good qualifications, to get good jobs. Like we want doctors, travellers as doctors, solicitors, barristers working in the mainstream. And why not? So I think we're doing that work. But I also think um, it, it needs to go beyond the, the organisations. Travellers that's out there, that's not involved in travel organisations, you have a voice too. You need it. You know, a lot of the times the state is failing travellers. We, we've seen ministers come and go. We've seen policies being made for travellers without travellers. We've seen how that impacts on travellers. Yeah. It, it, it's like it, a lot of the times... It's very slow, the work we're trying to do. And a lot of the times, travellers think, what are they actually doing? And there is a lot getting done, but it's slow. And the preventative work is getting done. We've seen there the text party, the 50808. 
Thomas, that was never going to happen. Tomorrow morning, no one's going to wake up and say, we're going to do this for Travis, without Travis. You know what I'm saying? So we're doing the preventative work. And unfortunately, I see Nancy Powers comment there in regards to another life lost. That, that hurt me yesterday. I know the family, I'm aware of them. And in that particular town, I don't want to name the town as such, but in that particular town, that is the fifth or sixth traveller person that died by suicide. And it was said earlier on, it was a very interesting point that was made earlier on. If that was any other town, bar the travel, if it was a different community, there'd be a crisis response plan put in place. Mm -hmm. Why is this happening? This shouldn't be happening. And yeah. travellers are no different, Thomas. You know that yourself. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I agree, Pat. And we'll come back to some of the questions that's raised in there. I'm trying to keep an eye on some of them. Um, but other members then, in terms of the work that that, uh, that you are involved in or that kind of projects that are involved in that are, are addressing the root causes, you know, kind of maybe you'd like to say something. Can I, can I come back in again, Thomas? Yeah, sure, yeah, go ahead. Then. Yeah, so I, I just like to talk about a, a group that I've been involved in establishing there about, it's about two months ago now that we started, but well, the conversation took place back in January or February of last year when I was working with LIT as the Access Project Officer. I met John O'Brien of Exchange House, and yeah. I met, uh, Maria of Exchange House, and we spoke about the work I was trying to do in promoting third, uh, education in the third level to travellers. But I suppose the gap that we, we spotted or I had identified previously was a gap in sports and, and not having a national traveller sports coordinator or a na national traveller sports project. I just felt there was a big market area that we were missing there, a big easier to work with people you know yeah. so with exchange house myself and the clear local development company and clear sports partnership we all got together and we decided look let's work together and see what we can do can we put something on for you know a group of travelers here in ennis and clear so with that we de we de developed a pilot program where it's a men's walk and talk program where we'd meet up with no real other agenda other than giving people a place to come meet up to talk about any issues that they may be having you know whether it be social issues or you know, mental health issues or drugs or gambling whatever issues they may have and then we can point them in the right direction and just to kind of let you know so on that program we have of the of the different men that are there we have two lads who lost their father to suicide we have two boys who lost a brother to suicide another lad who lost his sister to suicide, you know, all in the past 12 months or so. So this is very real for those people. But on the, on the positive side, they are now engaging with us with the program that we're delivering and talking about it. We now have two of those boys who have gone to bereavement counselling. Another two are looking into going to bereavement counselling. They're just at the early stage of talking about it. So it can be done and we just need to encourage people to go. Yeah. Be, happy, be willing to talk about these things and be willing to go to the right professional trained people so that we're providing a surface, uh, service where they're comfortable to come and make the initial connection, but then we point them in the right direction to the, mm -hmm. the relevant professional bodies. Yeah. Um, thanks, Dave. Does Frank or Margaret, do you want to come in on, on that question in terms of um, the work? Or yeah, I'll come in if you have right time. Come in there. Uh, you're on... You're on um, <laughs> on mute there Elizabeth I can't hear you okay um I was just agreeing with some of the e the educational things I had two sons one has finished college and one has finished the leave insert and um I noticed the traveler boys in secondary school um and and girls and I feel that the main thing that's happening with them they have to leave behind at home that they're a traveler um, they're torn between two two worlds and it's kind of a new age traveller now coming up where when I was in school my m mother was an activist for travellers I went to school with my head held so high I was so proud of who I was I felt guilty for the people that weren't travellers I felt sorry for them and although I didn't have anyone to play in the yard with and kids would say oh, you, don't, you don't seem like a traveller but I can't play with you anyway because you are I felt sorry for them because my mother and father inbred that much pride into me that I felt so sorry for them and I hated school because of it. Mm. But um, now with my own sons, although 
they were proud of who they were. Mm -hmm. I felt going in and even mixing them with other travel advice girls that have been in school, I find they have to, they're torn between two worlds and they don't know, they go to school and they're this person and then they come home and they have to go, it's almost like split personality. They have to come home and they have to be who they are in their own camp or their own community. And it's very hard and mentally that must be very draining. They also they have to learn, they have to put up with being called knacker, being wrote on their table and um, never feeling good enough in school. And so sometimes some of them hide who they are to make it easier, just to get the education down, to get it going. Yeah. And then they have to deal with being a different person. And then they go home and they have to set back into I'm at home now, I am, I'm John or I'm Elizabeth or I'm Joe or I'm whoever I am. And I'm in school, I'm, I'm a completely different person. And I think if people that's working with this kind of, if they have the ability to work in these kind of things, the prevention for that is maybe have speakers go into schools, have the tra teachers trained how to deal with situations. Because when my son was in school, um, I was called aside from the principal and he said to me, Elizabeth, can I talk to you for a minute? And I says, just stop me from going on too long. And I says, um, go ahead, uh, Mr. Whatever, I won't say his name. Um, how do you feel about your son hanging out with the travellers? And I said, um, well, I shouldn't have, well, I let him talk away for a minute. And I says, you know what? Um, I don't have a problem with it, considering he is a traveller and they're his relations. Um, and I'm very gobsmacked that you, somebody that they should be looking up to, has a problem um, dealing with them and teaching them. My child has never been in trouble in his whole life. He's a model student in this school and every school that he's been before this school. And I'm, I'm gobsmacked that you have the audacity to sit in this chair beside me and pull me aside. I thought my son was in trouble and pull me aside because my son is hanging out with his cousins at lunchtime. I'm, I was flabbergasted. I never got over it. Yeah. And I ju then that's when I started to tune in on children. And I know girls and boys that are in college now at the moment and their peers in school don't even know that they're travellers. And they go off and they get jobs in good jobs by pretending to not be who they are. And I think that's the very sad and that weighs down. Yeah really hard i think you're right and i think you need, like the high look if you look at the dropout rate uh yeah as, as travel children move into secondary school particularly i think that's connected to that you know as time moves on and 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 and, and travel children do don't feel that they can stay in school sometimes due to a whole lot of factors and i think there's a lot of pressure on them uh, and they, they just leave in the end it's, it's not supportive i was just asked to mention one thing and that is that um that look if people could that's watching this and that's tuned in could stay till the end uh, because at the end of this um, um, uh, uh, webinar uh, people are asked to light a candle that's the you know we're going to finish off with lighting a candle uh, to mark um, uh, World Suicide Prevention Day so it'd be important that people stay till the end and light the candle you know we'll, we'll do that collectively uh, hopefully. Uh, Frank do you want to add anything to that what's already said? Or I don't know how to want to come in and, and, and add you know something to it you know, there's not really a whole lot more to add. Only for like for myself as a mediator working around the country, I suppose we build up good relationships with a lot of organisations and a lot of services. So a lot of our work, I suppose, that people wouldn't be seeing is the signposting that we're doing. Yeah. But, we'd all, but we'd always follow up, Thomas, on that signposting because making them links between the families and the, the services. I would always follow up on that, keep in contact with the families the whole time. And uh, look, we'd always try to drop in. If we're in the county, we'd always try to drop in for a chat other than something other than conflict, if you know what I mean. Just a general chat, see how they're feeling, how they're doing. So that's what we do a lot of time as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think, I think signposting is very important and mm. that people know how to, how to get engaged with service. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that comes, come up in the post that are just kind of, that I was noting. I mean, the whole issue of, of debt, that travellers getting into debt and the pressure that that puts on families, you know, um, you know, and, and trying to pay back that debt and, and, and the stress and the worry around that. Drugs, the role of drugs 
in terms of um, you know uh, contributing to suicide and indeed the issue of homelessness came up there and in, and you know them issues are all coming into the frame as well uh, so they are in terms of uh, 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 people kind of losing hope and I suppose the question then that that comes up is well what are the gaps and and um, you know what needs to be put in place one what needs to be put in place to address some of these issues but also the issue of well what needs to be what do we need what can we do to actually give hope to the community that things are going to change that you know that we're going to create change or that change is going to be created so that's a very broad uh, two-pronged question i suppose i'm throwing out there what are the gaps and what how do we uh, kind of um you know how can we create hope that uh, for the community that things is going to change uh, because there's people on 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 the on the uh, in terms of the the chat there and you'll see it uh, that they're saying look trying to link with cams uh, not that not responsive uh, kind of getting very little response there's no the communication isn't there you know so how do we create or how do we kind of help create uh, the conditions that gives hope to the community that things are going to change again thomas can i will we go this suit will i take that go question ahead, uh, you know it's open so it's it's a very good point and it's a very good as you said it's two pronged for people's information um when we look at traveller culture, culture changes over time. Go back 20 years ago, drugs was never even mentioned with the travelling community. You look at every drug policy or strategy now, there's traveller input because of the impact of drugs among the travelling community. The all Ireland Traveller Health Study showed over 63% of travellers affected by drugs, okay? With the CAMS and the mental health and the drugs point of view, you have a situation that people might be aware of is the dual diagnosis. So you have a traveler that has a, um, a diagnosis of addiction and you have the same traveler that has a diagnosis of a mental health illness. When they present at a mental health service, the mental health service sees that this person has an addiction uh, issue. They'll send them to a drug service. When the drug service sees that the traveller has a diagnosis of a mental health problem, they'll send them back to the mental health service. So this is where the gaps are, and a lot of travellers get bound from one service to another. We have been trying to identify and trying to work ways to, to address that. Now, an important point is, for settled people that's looking here and listening in tonight, you're probably thinking, these are issues that affect the settled community, as well as the travellers. But unfortunately, like Elizabeth said at the start, the travellers in her family that died from, say, that had cancer, that had all those issues, they affect also the settled people, but they're affecting travellers at a higher, higher rate. Cancer, drugs, um, alcoholism, it doesn't affect the traveller body any different than the settled. But what we're seeing is travellers are dying at a higher, higher rate. And that is quite obviously wrong. For me, Thomas, the gap needs to be a Traveller Health Action Plan implemented. Because okay. I, I see in the comments for a mental health strategy, I'm not against that, but we need a Traveller Health Action Plan. Physical health and mental health, you can't have one without the other. You cannot have anything for travellers without looking at the social determinants. What is the social determinants? Accommodation, employment, health, what have you. Right. Ha, go for a walk. I go for me walk, guys, but I'm coming back to the site that has no running water, electricity. Postman won't come in. I'm okay. going into school place and discrimination and this stuff, Thomas. These are what's happening. It's it's very very broad. Do you know, it is, I, but we I need to we need to be able to address different aspects of it. We can't, you know, like in terms of breaking it down, that it's manageable, that it's doable, that it's understandable, and that there's different responsibilities for different aspects of it. You know, I think my own personal view is that there is a need for a national uh, health strategy, but there's also a need for a national travel mental health strategy because this is like if you look at the, the statistics that uh, from mental health across the, uh, the country, it's a national issue for starters. Uh, the second thing is that like uh, is that uh, smaller projects uh, can have an impact. But in terms of addressing it at a national level, it needs to be a national health strategy, like there needs to be a national accommodation strategy, like there needs to be a national. Uh, of course, you couldn't rule it out. Anyway, uh, like uh, you know, kind of, we won't we won't get into an argument about it now. But certainly, I would see it slightly different. Yeah, 
And although I agree with the need for a national health strategy, I think there's a, there's a need for national other strategies that deal with particular yeah. aspects. And it, I did say, Thomas, I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah. No, no, no. I understand. I agree. Other people, but I think the whole bit, in terms of uh, for the community as well, I think it's important that we focus today in terms of giving hope to the community because there's a lot of work happening in, in organizations, whether we kind of agree slightly or disagree slightly on, on some things. There's a lot of work happening in a lot of organizations across the country, including uh, kind of people that's linked into this. And so, how do we kind of, I think one of the ways, and this is my thinking, is the more collective that we create the space, the more collective space we create for people to come together like this and like the National Travel and Mental Health Network and other spaces where we can bring people together, travelers together to discuss this, the more of a picture we begin to get and the more kind of uh, collective uh, we begin to get in terms of the action that's needed. That's my kind of, and the, that, that creating that space for people to talk about it, that's my kind of um, understanding. Anyone else want to come in on that? How do we create that hope? Anybody else <laughs> want to take that one? Hope? Thomas, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in quickly there, Thomas. Can you hear me now? Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I suppose what I'm, I'm looking, I'm a very optimistic person, I have to say, and I always do look for the best and look for hope. So, as I mentioned earlier when I, when I spoke, I'm going back to college to try to study to be a PE teacher. Right. So I want to be one of the people, the voice of change. But I know there's a, another traveller man, Owen Ward in Galway, who's recently graduated. And we have people like Eileen Flynn now on the Senate. You yeah. know, we, we're getting people in, 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 in positions of power, I suppose. And what better way to, I suppose, give hope to our young children is to have traveller teachers up and down the country who are promoting positive culture, positive travellers in the education system where a lot of our young people learn, you know, that's where they learn a lot. They, they're, they're influenced a lot by school as well and how their relationships with teachers and, and with, with the system goes. So if we, if we can increase the number of traveller teachers, the number of traveller nurses, doctors, Garda, you know, all the, the public services, then I do think that you know, we, we will start to see positive change and, and hope. But I, I just want to, to kind of say this to any other any of the other travellers that are here tonight. We are role models for our children and for the younger generation. And, and I just would like to say, look, you are probably the biggest role models in their lives. So let them see a positive, positive from coming from you and that will help shape their future and, and the future generations of travellers. You know, we, we, we all know that the, the the issues and the, the, you know, the discrimination and the prejudice and the racism that's out there. But unless we start to channel a bit of hope from ourselves as well and give off that, I suppose, beacon of light yeah. um, to the younger people, uh, younger of, of the community, then, you know, we're, that's where I see uh, and you see things going, Thomas. Really, so increase the numbers of traveller teachers, politicians, whatnot, you know, and get get let's you know fight this together. Bridget, you wanted to come in there. Yeah, if you don't mind, Thomas, I'd just like to say that um, um, unless the racism and discrimination is addressed and that, you know, that the hate legislation is put in place for travellers, mm -hmm. that's where we're going to see major change for travellers. That is the root cause to a lot, as we said earlier. Um, we need, to, you know, if that was addressed, we'd see more children access in third level education. We would see better accommodation, better health, mm -hmm. and also um, we'd see more travellers in employment. But until such time the government takes it on board that the hate legislation needs to be put in place and travellers need to be protected under that law, especially when it comes to it, hate, discrimination mm -hmm. and racism that we're experiencing on a daily basis. Yeah. We're not going to see... Yeah, and unless people's rights are really... I mean, look at, like, an example of that is that house recently that got burned in Galway. That's right, yeah. So, I mean, like... You know, you, 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 it's no wonder that people's travel's mental health is affected. I mean, like, and all the other stuff. Well, there needs to be accountability, you know, for this kind of action, because if it was any other community out there, yeah. that it would actually be challenged. But yeah. it's happening too often. And what's happening is, Thomas, within our own community as well, that it seems to be becoming the norm. You know, travellers don't actually challenge when they are being discriminated, not being allowed into bars not been allowed into shops. It seems to be, you know, they're just letting it go. 
where yeah. they should complain and log complaints to, you know, the ENR and so on yeah. and so forth. Otherwise, we're just going to be, nothing is going to change for travellers. I think that also we need to see major intervention as well from the Minister of Health in relation to um, addressing the high suicide rates that we do have within the community. And also, um, there needs to be more um, equine. You know, traveller men are big into the horses as well, and it's part of our culture. It's, it's, um, it's a, it's a way of of helping men to cope with some. Not all traveller men are into the horses either. You know, <laughs> but I'm just saying that there needs to be more investment around that in equine um, uh, therapy and, you know, centres as well, uh, equine centres for traveller men. And, you know, we had a model going here or in and um, going back a few years ago. But the block for us was that we couldn't get land. We had worked with the local authority trying to get land because we had a lot of engagement from traveller men. And we could see, you know, the engagement was positive and the men were enjoying it. But then you come up again the obstacle of, you know, not being able to get land and you're coming up again the block the whole time. So, yeah, again... Absolutely. And I think that's, that's a big thing. The travellers feel that they come up against them blocks, whether it's in the services, whether it's when, they, when they're getting, uh, whether it's around accommodation, whether it's around health, whether it's, you know, whatever sort of blocks. There's always seems to be a there is, block. Yeah, there's always seems to be a block, Thomas. Yeah, and does. then as well, when it comes to traveller accommodation, the local authority is not drawing down the traveller accommodation budget. That yeah. needs to be addressed. And, you know, um, until such time sanctions are put in place as well for the local authorities and not spending the money. You know, we need to see accommodation improve for travellers. Because... Do. You know, they're living in dire living conditions, terrible living conditions. And we have families out there that don't even have basic sanitation. Yeah. So it all needs to be addressed. And as uh, Pa had said earlier, it's not just one layer. There's, there's a lot of layers that needs to be addressed for yeah. to improve the mental health and well-being and to reduce the suicide rate within our community. Because I'm, I'm conscious that we're, that, we're, that we're kind of, we're coming, this bit of it is coming to an end. And like, uh, kind of in terms of, like for me, the biggest hope, is the number of travellers who's involved in the last 15 or 20 years in terms of uh, activism uh, it, for me signals the biggest hope in terms of uh, collective change and the number of people who's become involved in 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 in, in the traveller struggle uh so there's and the number of even you know any of the panels i mean like we have a wealth of talent in the travel community you know and a wealth of experience uh, so we do uh, and skills and I think it's that talent and skills and experience uh, coming together that can create real change you know for me and I think that's for me that's one of the biggest hopes I think like we we've struggled for for decades at this stage uh, for change change in accommodation uh, change in e equality uh, uh, legislation change in uh, you know and recognition as a traveler as a minor as, as a as an ethnic minority um, and we have won some battles However, I think, you know, kind of uh, some of the biggest battles that we have still to win is around, is around health, is around mental health and is around accommodation, you know, unemployment. I think, uh, but I think we can win them battles. But I think like we're, we really are, we depend on them on another collectively as a community to do that. And that's, for me, that's the biggest hope. I think if, we're, if we don't, uh, if, if we don't, uh, aren't actively involved in that process, I think the services, we're going to be waiting a long time for change to happen. We have to, we have to create some ways. We have to, to lead that change. And I think, for me, I think that energy is there as well. I have to say, you know, being part of the, uh, the National Travel and Mental Health Group, uh, the National Travel and Mental Health Network, is a real pleasure. It's it, just the energy that's in that and the, and, uh, and the commitment to change, you know. And most of the organisations are linked into the steering group of that and are members of that. And that's, I think that collective space has been really, for me, that's been really good and, and, and a real kind of sense of hope. And that's open to all who's ever out there who wants to become members of that. Uh, but certainly there are, for me, there's a lot of hope because people aren't kind of accepting it uh, where it's at. Families aren't accepting it. I engage with families every day of the week, uh, so do. And people are saying, Let, you know, we need change. How do we get that? How do we change that? How do we begin? And people are engaging with services. So with, with travel organizations to bring that change about. Uh, so for me, that's one of the biggest kind of signals that there's a lot of um, uh, hope for change to happen and that the community want that change to happen. You know, I don't know about others. I mean, uh, you know, uh, but certainly for me, that's, that's where I place my trust, you know, and, uh, and, and that's where I get my energy from. 
uh, from the community, you know, in terms of that change, uh, to go forward and bring, bring that message to, you know, whoever the authorities is and kind of uh, bring it forward. Uh, but I don't know about other people. What is other people's feeling on that? Or on anything else about bringing hope? Um, because we have only a few minutes left and I'm going to finish off with... Uh, um, Thomas, if I may come in just briefly, I think for me, and um, there, there's uh, two things I'd like to, for, for people that's listening here tonight, service providers and for travellers, is the importance of the ethnic identifier. And you hit the hammer on the nail, Thomas, when you said it's making the, the invisible visible. So on one hand, I would encourage the services to introduce the ethnic identifier and for travellers to identify as travellers. And that would be a great start in going forward. Okay, other other panelists. What message would you leave with the with the? Uh, okay, thanks for that, Pan. That's uh, you know encouraging words, and I think everything that's been said tonight. Just to say uh, that uh, that the questions that has come up on the thing, uh, uh, many people has had sent in comments and questions, and they will be all collected and will be answered by email. So there will be answers, the ones we didn't get to. Uh, so, um, but other other members of the panel, before I give back to um, uh, to Bridget. For a handbrack, Bridget, uh, what message would you like to leave the community? Uh, we'll start with you, Frank. You're you're on you're on mute. Sorry, Thomas. You're all right. You're all right. Uh, for me, if there's one message I'd like to leave to the community, um, unfortunately, depression, suicidal thoughts, or suicide does not discriminate discriminate against age, gender, or sexuality. You're never too old to look for, seek, seek help, look for advice, to talk to people. The help is out there. Look for it and talk to people. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Thanks. Uh, David, what about you? What message would you like to give the community? Or indeed to all the viewers? That yeah, to... yeah. Perfect, Thomas. Um, look, I would like just people within our community to take ownership of our lives, all right? Engage with the various different service providers and challenge negative press and, you know, with positive actions. And above all, let's stick together. You know, we are, we are a small community in the, in the bigger scheme of things. Let's work together. Let's not be judging our own, you know, no more over judgments of the community. Stick together and, you know, challenge these mental health issues and, and address them by, you know, speaking out. Yeah. Margaret? Um, I suppose uh, the message I would leave for people listening is, as somebody who has battled with mental health issues in the past and depression, the dark days do get better. There is light at the end of the tunnel. There are supports out there. If it's not, um, if, it's, if you can't speak to your family, there's other people um, to link in and, and don't hold, hold it all in. You know, people people want to listen to you um, and people will support you. So don't feel alone. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to leave the community with a message? Well, the only message I can really say is tune into yourself every now and again um, in a busy life when you're non-stop 24-7 doing this, doing that. Um, and it's easy just to chill out and watch Netflix and, 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 and that's it. And um, just kind of, um, even if it's a random stranger, I found it's hard to talk sometimes to your own family because you almost get awkward and embarrassed and not knowing what to say. And sometimes... If someone comes to talk to you and they have a mental health problem, you don't have to say anything. Yeah. All they want you to do is listen yeah. and be there. And I just think I never really went out and talked to anyone really in my own family when things was on my mind because I didn't want people not to want to be able to come to me thinking I'm a damsel in distress or um, I'm this flake that I can't um, help somebody in need because in me in my life I want to be seen as strong and I'm stronger now than I've ever been so if any of the family is watching I'm not a flake <laughs> you can ask me a favour mm. but um, I would just say like tune into things that you shouldn't really be doing um, like if you feel you're, you're wanting to drink more than you should or you're going out to do the drugs like the teenagers or whatever, even the grown married men and, and, and you know, going out doing drugs when, why are you doing them? No normal 
sane person wants to go out and do these things to their body. I know I didn't want to overeat and try to actually to get to 25 stone. <laughs> so mm. find out why you're doing what you're doing. That's all I would say. Okay. Get to the root of it. Okay, well, thanks very much, Elizabeth. Pa, any final word from you? On the message you'd like to leave the community? Yeah, Thomas, I suppose um, the, the panels I spoke about there and just looking at the, like we haven't even touched on stigma and stuff like that. I just think, um, come on, it's time for travellers now. Um, do you know, we're, we are small, we're 40,000 of us all together in Ireland. I think it's time to put our energy in to tackling and addressing the mental health and suicide of our community. Nancy Power said it there, enough is enough. And we have to collectively do something about this because it's going to just go into the next generation. We don't want that. Okay, well, thanks very much, Pa. And I'd like to thank all the panel uh, for, you know, their contributions and their openness and their honesty. And, you know, um, which isn't an, always an easy uh, issue to tackle, you know, uh, uh, mental health and indeed suicide. Um, so I'd like to thank you all very much. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us uh, uh, for this discussion and hope that you've got something out of it. Uh, and for people who do need support, I'd repeat again, there are numbers available uh, that people can contact uh, if they do feel, and feel free to, you know, to kind of to call and certainly the Travel Council Service and indeed I'm sure the other services as well be more than willing to talk to you. Uh, for me, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you all and, and, to, and to chair the panel. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand back to Bridget now. Uh, and I'd like to thank Eileen for her contribution. Eileen, thanks very much for your contribution. I thought it was very good. And uh, so I'd like to hand back to Bridget now, uh, to Bridget Kelly. And okay. It's just, um, and I suppose we've come to the, to the end and just like to thank uh, Thomas McCann for um, leading out in the panel discussion here today. And also to all the uh, panel speakers, Frank, David, Margaret, Pa, Elizabeth, for sharing her personal experience here today. And um, also I'd like to say um, thanks to Eileen for um, coming and launching today's event. And also thanks to everyone that has joined us here tonight and um, got involved in the discussion. And as Thomas has said, the questions that have been posted here that we will get back by email. And also if anyone has been affected um, by today's discussion, you can contact the Samaritans on 116123 or um, you can call or uh, text hello to 50808 or PAVI to 50808. Um, just to say thanks again to everyone for the contributions. Um, you know, we had a great discussion, well, a discussion on the impacts of the suicide and mental health within our community, but also looked at the solutions. And as Thomas has said, you know, there's, there's a lot of hope for change to happen and we just need, need to bring that forward. So um, again, thanks very much for every, to everyone for joining. And I know that a candle has been sent to everyone that has joined here today. So if people would like to share that on their screen, and thank you all for everything. Thank you. Believe it or not, believe it or not, I can't find a match. <laughs> the one thing that I, the one thing that I don't have is a light. I don't have a light. Sorry, guys. I'm sorry about this. So. So I'd have to just, you'll have to imagine me with a candle. <laughs> we forgive you, Thomas. Yeah, I'll, light one, I'll have to light one later. I'll have to, uh, I'm a non-smoker and nobody smokes here, so it's not a match in the, in the place. Right. Anyway, it's great to see you as well. So. Right. Thomas, the toaster. What? The toaster. The toaster. <laughs> the toaster. <laughs> I don't want to burden the place. <laughs> no, I don't think I'll, I'll try that. No. Ah, that's a good idea, John. That's a good idea. Did you, is, that, is that an app? Uh, why do you do that? That's, that's the best one there. Health and, safe, health, health and safety, Thomas. Health and safety. Where do you get Is that an app? <laughs> YouTube. Thomas, I think there's a link as well in one of the emails we received, which uh, yeah, okay. click the link. Right, okay. And I'll definitely light a candle when I go home. I'm still in the office though, that's why I can't get a light. I'm still here. So, uh.
Thomas, I have a light. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, th thanks, Pa. <laughs> That's very really helpful. <laughs> are you are you gonna are you gonna come over with it? <laughs> it's only a money down the road. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, there it is. What I'll do is I'll take a picture of you all. Yeah. That's all you. Hmm. Yeah. So now I have loads of lights. <laughs> Anyway, hopefully, um, hopefully that that uh, uh, you know, kind of um, the line. I think it's worth mentioning as well. Like, um, there's still over fifty-five uh, participants at eight o'clock in the evening, and that speaks a lot. And uh, thanks to all those who who stayed online. Fair play to them. No, I think it's really important, and I think well done, you know, to the to the group who organised it, uh, to Maria and to John and to. Susie and Pa and all the others who was part of that group, you know, because it I think it is an important event and I think, you know, um, that it's important that we come together and that we do uh, share the experiences, but also that there's support and solidarity as well, you know, kind of, and I think that's that's really important. So well done and, and thanks to all who organised it. Yeah. Thank And also, I think it, some people are saying here, and I think it's just to kind of, you know, to, uh, to as as a kind of uh, to, to all those who have died by suicide, to rem you know that it's a, it's also kind of a, a remembrance to them, and kind of may they all rest in peace, you know, kind of on on a day like today. So it's important that that it's kind of remembered and all all, all, the, all the people who's not with us. So I think the I think um we're gonna close soon, Marie. Is that yeah? I can't hear you, you're on, you're on, you're on there. Yes, we will close it now. I think we've done, we've done the best we could for being the first webinar. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> the technical support hasn't struggled, but we've managed to come to the end. So thanks well a lot. Do you want well done, everybody. Well done. Well done. Right. Well done. Right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks to all. Guys, I'm drained. I'm absolutely drained. <laughs> a good night, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us. Brilliant. Well, Bye. Well, well, the well, 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 well done, well done. everybody. Well done. Well done. Thank you very much. Good luck, guys. Thomas, yeah. thanks again. Thomas, Great. you were brilliant. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yes. Cheers. Good night. Bye. Bye.